The following is a conversation with His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, recorded on the 13th of June, 1974, in Paris, France. Kotovsky is the director of Indology in Moscow. So my talk with was published in some Yes, uh, I have this book in my office in Paris. But he does not believe in incarnation and he still is professor of Indology. He doesn't believe in the soul. Professor Kotovsky doesn't believe in the existence of soul. But I think that he's a Marxist. Yes, he's a or at least he has to appear as one to meet yes. in his position. Prabhupada's point... There are many professors of, in Russia, in religion, on the history, on the history of religion, but who, who don't believe in nothing. That was, that was Prabhupada's point, and it's ironic that in modern societies men are called professors for being proficient in knowledge, but yet they're ignorant of the soul, which is the most basic knowledge, the most fundamental knowledge. According to the Vedic system, Indian system, even the most ignorant man knows about the soul, what to speak of the great learned sages. But in this society, Western society, the so-called learned men, they're supposed to be the topmost learned men. They don't even know of the soul. Therefore, they're not even in the class of an ignorant man. They're lower than even ignorance. And according to Vedic understanding, one who does not understand what is soul, he identifies himself with this body, He's animal. So, in the Vedic language, one who has taken this body as self, the shākma buddhi gunapi tridhātuke and sadhik kalatā dīśu and own man, the family, society, community, national, not outside that, sadhi. They are my own man. Sadhik kalatradi su bhuma ijadhi and the land of birth, worshiping, nationalism. Jatitha buddhi shalile nakari chit and holy place to take bath in the water of Jordan or Ganges. Such persons are considered as go khara. Go means cow, khara means ass. That means animals. What is your conception of the soul? Do you believe in the soul? What do you mean by this? Soul? Yes, I know. I, I, do, I cannot say that I know what is soul. I know that there are souls, that I, that I have the soul. But uh, I think that it's very difficult to give uh, adequate... He says he knows that he has a soul, but he thinks it would be hard to give an accurate definition of the soul. He, he, he knows what is soul, what is difficult to give definition. So he says he can accept that he has a soul. I certainly be, I accept. But it would be it would be hard to describe he thinks that the nature of the soul. He said a body, which is something tangible we can describe, but something of a spiritual nature like the soul must be much more difficult to describe. You can describe it by the negative way that soul is not body. Then we are still left with the problem, what is the relationship between the two? Yeah. First of all, let us understand what is the soul. But that is describing the Bhagavad Gita. Najayata namyati makadachi nitta sasato yam nahannati hannavani jarire padadhyam asosyam akledhyam 
विद्युत पड़ेगा जायते मिते बाक दाचिन नायम बुद्धा बगिता बान भूया अजो नित्य शास्त्रो यम पुराण धन्य ते हन्य माने शरीर translation for the soul there is never birth nor death nor having once been does he ever cease to be he is unborn eternal ever existing undying and primeval he is not slain when the body is slain vida vinashitam nityam yainam ajivam ajamavyayam katam sa purushak parta kam gatayati hantikam O Partha, how can a person who knows that the soul is indestructible, unborn, eternal and immutable, kill anyone or cause anyone to kill? But I cannot say that it is a definition. Do you say in English definition? Yeah, definition. I cannot say that it is a definition. It is a sort of, a characteristic. A sort of creed of profession. No, it is characteristic. Uh, yes. Definition means you mention the characteristic. That is definition. Definition, you mention the characteristic. So that can be mentioned directly, or if it is not perceivable, then you can define in opposite way. Just like we have got experience, everything in the material world, it is beginning. There is a beginning. Your body, mind, body, everything. It has got a beginning, and it has got an end. So it is stated, no jayate nam riyatriva. It has no beginning, no end. And nitya, itana, sasata, very old, purana. Na hannate hannamane sarire. It is not destroyed, annihilated, after the destruction of the body. So if we accept this definition, then we can understand the soul is eternal. Or characteristic, if we accept this characteristic, nahanate hanamane sarire, after the destruction of body, the soul is never destroyed, then you can understand the soul is eternal. And it is clearly stated, nahanate hanamane sarire, after the destruction of the body, it is not destroyed. So it means it takes another body. He says that's not necessarily the logical conclusion. He says he's familiar with that theory, but it's more a question of faith. He says it's not actually a logical conclusion that if the soul leaves this body, it must take another one. What does he mean by logic? He says that means that it's not something that's very evident to me. Hmm. He may not be evident to him, but why not others? He says one thing is that he feels kind of glad that it's more or less a question of opinion. Because if it was absolute truth, then it would be too restricting for everyone. No, it is absolute truth, but there are different ways of understanding absolute truth. He is taking only one way, direct perception. He said if it were an absolute truth, it would be evident to everyone. Yes, but everyone is not advanced in knowledge. He says the question remains because there are other very spiritually advanced men who don't accept that idea. No, somebody may be known as spiritually advanced according to the society, but he may not be. So another thing is that what is the way of understanding the Absolute Truth? Let him explain. What is the standard way of understanding Absolute Truth? He says he doesn't have an answer in that kind of a context. It may be problematic to some, but Absolute Truth can be understood by śruti, authoritative hearing. The absolute truth is known by the absolute method, which is called śruti, hearing from the absolute. Absolute cannot be imagined or speculated. So that is a fundamental point. Yes. So therefore we accept absolute truth from the absolute. And according to the Vedic system, in different times and different places, according to the mentality and the culture of the people, the Absolute has made himself known on different levels, higher and lower levels. But that the Absolute as revealed through the Vedas, specifically the Bhagavad Gita, is the most advanced level. It is the standard by which all other levels are judged. 
is the most advanced, complete knowledge. But it's not just an opinion. It's not just a secular idea. By scientific <coughs> principle, if we consider the logic of all the propositions of Bhagavad Gita in relation to the Bible and Koran, if we're actually impartial and open, then we'll understand that truth. It's not a matter of opinion. It's a matter of superior logic. Extending the same basic truths to their highest perfection. So in discussing the merits of Bhagavad Gita versus another scripture, it's not that we're trying to argue just for the sake of polemics, but to establish the real standard. What is the most elevated or advanced standard of the knowledge? But well, people are suffering due to lack of that accurate knowledge. Yeah. And our Krishna consciousness movement is trying to make that knowledge available in practical activity to stop this suffering. It is not just a philosophy without practice. That is the reason why it is important for discussing, not just for the sake of discussing, but for the sake of bringing out the highest principles for actions. So according to Vedic way, Krishna is the absolute truth. Krishna is absolutely accepted by the acharyas. Indian civilization is carried on the advice of the acharya sampradha. So all the acharyas like Sankaracharya, Ramanucharya, Muddhacharya, they all accept Krishna as the absolute truth. So when you hear from Krishna, then we get absolute knowledge. The reason why we gather like this to discuss these principles is that just like a group of scholars will gather to refine and crystallize their their knowledge. He, he must excuse himself. His prior I just want to finish the one point I was making. That the reason we gather like this and we desire to discuss with other personalities, other people, different uh, views of religion is for the sake of the edification of everyone. So that the highest principles can be isolated and so we can advance the purpose of religiosity. It's not simply for the sake of argument that we pose questions. But it's for the sake of the edification or the crystallization of the highest principles of religion. I absolutely agree on this point. He says that he's familiar with this this principle. Not so familiar, I know. <laughs> he, he says he's, he's he knows of it, but he doesn't consider himself to be an expert. But because yeah. you're a part of God, you have real interest in this. He says uh, he's willing to admit this philosophy, even though he doesn't uh, belong to it himself. He sees this as being a. Uh, une aspect d'une culture spéciale. Non, Dieu non, ça, ça, ça cohérence interne par quelque chose. He appreciates the fact that it has a, co a coherent aspect that it holds together logically. And this is what he appreciates. He respects the Vaishnava philosophy because it it is substantial. It doesn't contradict itself. So then the if the Vaishnava philosophy has a systematic logic, then integrity would dictate that we have to surrender or accept that logic. We, if the logic is true, we can't stand apart from it and simply observe it. We have to accept it ourselves. You are right on the brink of absolute truth. Don't run away. He so, said that even though he has a great interest in this discussion, because he has prior commitments, so he's unable to... That's how it is. Of course. It's That's how it is. I have. I have and I operate with great interest. Thank you very much. Tomorrow night we have very nice conference in South Playa. I have seen in many places. I have seen. So you're welcome to come. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What is his position? He's the head of the Russian Orthodox Church. He's the head of the church, but he cannot. Uh, he feels he's not qualified to discuss spiritual matters. Once last year, a man in London, professor at a religious school, said the same thing. And you said that according to our Vedic philosophy, if a teacher doesn't know something, he should step down. And his answer was, "I can't do that." <laughs> it seems amazing. It says fundamental questions. We may mute such people like this who are supposed to be qualified to, to bring other people out of the distress.
That's why the church now has lost everyone because even its leaders are saying, I don't know anything. I'm just fumbling around like everyone else. I don't really know anything definite. He's still his leader. Yes. <coughs> if the impersonalists, uh, Lord Chaitanya said that they are the greatest offenders to Lord Krishna. So most of the so-called religious people of the world today, if they have a conception of God, it is that God is impersonal spirit. Does that mean that they are to be classified, at least in terms of, of this understanding, amongst the demons and asuras? No. In this instance, this man is not as much that he's an impersonalist as he has no clear idea one way or the other. He's ignorant. An impersonalist is someone, in the classic sense, who has... You know, he's aware of the Vaishnava philosophy, but he rejects that. But God is definitely not a person. But and he takes that as being a lower conception. In ignorance, though, even though he's in ignorance, he's hurting people due to his ignorance. By He's claiming to be a teacher, and even though he may be innocent or ignorant, it's because he's in that position of leader, he's actually hurting people. Wasting their life. He left Sri Prabhupada because he was very afraid that we were right. He was very afraid because... He said he had another engagement. Mm -hmm. yes, in the world today, it seems as if, just like the men, take advantage of women and make them topless and bottomless. Also, they try and encourage people like this to be leaders of religion. That way, the mass of people don't take any real interest. They do this in Russia, too, because they kill the sincere religious leaders, and they put their own men, the religious leader, and just sort of undermines the whole purity and the importance of the instruction. I mean, no one in the West also, in the past 10 years, there's been a resurgence of what's called fundamentalism. For so long, the Christian doctrine got so hodgepodge and so wishy-washy that people were leaving because there was simply nothing there solid for them to grasp onto. Now fundamentalism, or the very basic principles that God is the Almighty, and that we are sinners, and if we don't repent, God's going to strike us down with wrath and, uh, and anger. That, that basic principle of fear of God, that is receiving new support. Many people are coming back to that, because even though it's, it's a very vague thing, still it's something definite. God is there, and if I do something wrong, He's going to cut me down rather than, well, nothing's wrong, nothing's right, it's all hodgepodge, wish-wash. People can't grasp onto that. There's nothing for them to... Uh, even that is Mahavad. Nothing wrong, nothing right. Everything is all right. Hmm. Vivekananda's philosophy. So, Prabhupada, I think we'll leave around 7.30, so perhaps you can take a little rest before hmm. the engagement.